the readings taken from 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, and beginning at verse 13. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep. Let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate plate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Janet. Good morning, everyone. Um, just to explain that I am not dressed to support any particular football team or Formula One driver. I am literally just wearing orange. I could say papaya. Anyway, that, that's uh, for the Formula One fans among you. But anyway, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this opportunity to continue uh, looking through uh, this letter. And I pray that um, what you want us to hear this morning is what we will hear. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I, um, I used a particular photo that I found of a newspaper article um, in January when we thought about a very similar subject, um, and I thought I just couldn't resist showing it again. Here it is. We don't know when Jesus will return, says our Tita. That's the um, Arsenal manager, um, not knowing quite when his player, Jesus, 
will return. Um, I couldn't not show it again. I'm sorry. I won't show it again, I promise you. Um, but that's what we're thinking about today. We're thinking about the return of Jesus, not the football player, not the Euros, but Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. That's what we're going to think about this morning. Now, when we look in Thessalonians, in 1 and 2 Thessalonians, we see a bit of a context. We see that a lot of it is about the return of Jesus. About a fifth of 1 Thessalonians and about a third of 2 Thessalonians are about this very subject. In fact, every chapter of 1 Thessalonians, usually towards the end of a chapter, Paul reminds the people of Thessalonica that Jesus will return Why does he say so much about it? Well, let's think about um, why Paul needs to say this. Now, the fact is that we can see that that Paul had preached the gospel in Thessalonica, and he'd done such a good job of preaching that Jesus would return, which is, of course, part of the gospel, and we often, we sometimes sort of miss that out, but that is part of the good news. Um, And that Paul had preached it so well that he would return possibly in their lifetime that the Thessalonians were worried about those Christians who died before Jesus returned. Maybe some of them had taken um, that Jesus would, would return so quickly that they'd even given up their jobs. Maybe they'd not even thought about bereavement or even their own deaths. And because the Thessalonians had become so concerned about those who'd died along with other questions about death, Paul writes to remind them of all they had to hope for in the context of the fact that Jesus will return. That's the context of what um, Paul was saying and, and the people of Thessalonica. But it's important for us to realize as well that in the Greek and Roman world at the time, there was quite a lot of pessimism about what happens after death. Most thought there wasn't much hope. There are some statements um, from the thinkers of the time. One of them says this, once a man dies, there is no resurrection. And then a guy called, I'm going to get this right, Theocritus, uh, says this, there is hope for those who are alive, but those who have died are without hope. It's a little bit like that modern proverb, isn't it? Uh, Where there's life, there's hope. And then a guy called Catullus um, said this, when once our brief life sets, there is one perpetual night through which we must sleep. Well, that's really not very good news, is it? So at the time, death was like a, a pretty hopeless thing. Such a contrast to what we will see this morning from our reading. There are two parts to this reading. The first part, which is most of the reading we had from chapter 4, is about what happens to those who've died when Jesus returns. And that second part, which was chapter 5, is about Jesus' return and how we should live in the light of that. But before I go any further, I just want to acknowledge that, of course, this is a difficult subject for many of us. Whether we are bereaved, whether recently or many years ago, whether we know someone who is dying or we're facing our own death, whether we have family members who don't know Jesus, we need to acknowledge that this is a difficult subject. But what I hope this morning will do is that it will be an encouragement to each one of us, that we don't leave feeling hopeless, but hope full. I hope that we will see that an understanding of what will happen when Jesus returns changes everything and should impact how we view life and how we view death. And so the way we're going to do that this morning is we're going to have some do's and some don'ts. Um, We're going to start with the don'ts because I always think it's better to start that way and finish with the do's. Um, So our first don't from this passage is very much from the very start of this passage, when Paul says, don't be uninformed. Verse 13, he says this, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. I've already said, haven't I, that the the Thessalonians were worried about those Christian brothers and sisters who'd already died. What would happen to them when Jesus came back? 
And Paul spends the next few verses showing them that there is nothing for them to be worried about. He says, Jesus died and rose again. He made it possible for us to know a resurrected life. Here's verse 14. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Now, there's quite a lot of language in this reading this morning about sleep. I love sleep. (laughs) Um, But um, here, this language of being asleep in Christ. It's not Paul saying that these people are unconscious. He's still saying that they have died. Yet that language of being asleep is a reminder that it's only temporary. We can see that uh, very clearly, actually, if we look elsewhere in the New Testament. Here's one example in Acts 7, verse 60, when Stephen has been stoned to death. And he says these words just before he dies. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, he didn't start snoring. He did, at this point, die Notice the language in our reading. Paul says, those who have fallen asleep in him. It is in Christ that we find life, even in death. I remember when I first studied theology and the lecturer took us through all the references in the New Testament to being in Christ. And I have to say, I was absolutely blown away. Do it. It's, it's incredible when you read all the things that we find in Christ. And surely this is the most blow away thing, you know, to discover that when we are in Christ, whether dead or alive, we will be raised with him. I read this uh, the other day. Your address when you die in Christ. That's good, isn't it? I love that. You know, we are in Christ now. When we die, we are in Christ. Paul makes it clear that we will be with him. And he goes on to describe the events when Jesus returns. Now, the first thing to say is that this isn't going to be a secret rapture, as some people talk about. You know, one writer describes verse 16 as the loudest verse in the Bible. Let me just read it to you again. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. That's not a quiet secret, is it? You know, the Lord commanded the the voice of an angel, the trumpet call of God. I think our decibel meter might struggle. It's that sort of volume. We know, we will know about it when it happens. And Paul reminds us that those who have died will actually have front row seats. They will be raised first, says Paul. So the Thessalonians don't need to worry about those who have died, and neither do we. They won't miss anything. And those in Christ, says Paul, who haven't died, will be with them. Verse 17 says this, After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Basically, this is going to be the biggest Christian meeting ever. We couldn't find a stadium big enough. And it's not going to be cringy. You know, there's not going to be complaints about the style of music or the the, the comfortableness of the seats. It will just be amazing, incredible. It's good news, isn't it? Good. I'm just going to check that. It's good news, isn't it? Good. Just checking you're awake. Excellent. Okay. So that's the first thing. Don't be uninformed. The second thing, don't be surprised. In chapter 5, verse 3, Paul describes those who say peace and safety, that they feel that they can't be touched. But when Jesus returns, it will affect every single person, those in Christ and those not. Paul says this in in verse 4, But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. Paul reminds the Thessalonians that he's told them this already, but he reminds them that they shouldn't be surprised. 
Jesus will come like a thief in the night. And of course, he says that, doesn't he, elsewhere. Um, In Matthew 24, he says this, Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. That imagery of a thief coming in the night is that Jesus' return will be sudden and unexpected. But we know it will happen, so we don't need to be surprised about it. Not only will it be sudden and expected when Jesus returns, it will also be sudden and unavoidable. That's why Jesus uses, um, where, that's why Paul uses those, that phrase, like labor pains. And of course, that is the challenge for those who are not in Christ, that it will be sudden and unavoidable. And surely that should give us an impetus, shouldn't it, to share the good news of Jesus with those who don't know him. Verse 3 uh, says this, Destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. That's a challenge, isn't it? My final don't is this, don't grieve like the world. Right at the beginning of our reading, we heard these words. I'm going to read them once more. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. We only need to look around, don't we, and see how the world grieves. It's still really quite a taboo subject for many, like when we struggle even to use the word death because we just can't talk about it. Or when we see the rise of things like simply cremation, which sort of stops those grieving having an opportunity to say goodbye. Paul doesn't want the Thessalonians to have hopeless grief. Instead, he wants them to have the hope that those who have died before Jesus' return will be with him. And just to point out, Paul doesn't say don't grieve at this point. Of course we grieve. And I know there are people here this morning, those online, who are grieving at this time. Instead, it's it's about not grieving like the world, where death is hopeless. This is grieving for those who have died knowing Jesus in Christ. We, of course, mourn, don't we, at Christian funerals. For example, many of us have been at such services here, which have been so full of hope. And in those services, there was a sense of celebration, a celebration of Jesus' victory over death. But as John Stott says, we do that through tears. Jesus himself wept at the grave of Lazarus, his friend. So it's not not grieving. (laughs) It's grieving those who have died in Christ with the hopefulness of Jesus' return. Let's move on to the do's. A very brief one to start with. The first do is do hold on to the knowledge of Jesus' return. Because this helps us, doesn't it? It helps us in our grief to know what will happen. Even if we don't know when or exactly what it will look like, we have the knowledge that Jesus will return and we will be with him, with all his people. All we thought about today should give us such a hope of what is to come. And of course, if that was Paul's aim for the Thessalonians he was writing to, surely that is the same for us. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing is to be ready. Do be ready. Verse 4 of chapter 5 says this, But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. We know that Jesus will return, but none of us know when. So we can't solve this problem by knowing the date. I mean, we can look back in history, can't we, even probably around today, those people who try and work out what day Jesus is going to return. I remember something a few years ago when that happened, and uh, lots of people seemed to sort of sell all their possessions and give up all their, their money, and then Jesus didn't return, and then they were stuck. We don't know when. 
Actually, one extra don't really. Don't obsess about the details so that you fail to live today. Just know that you can be ready for it. We can be ready. And Paul uses various ways to show us how to be ready. Ready. Here's what he says in this passage. You are all children of light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. There we have that imagery there of light and dark, day and night. And it reminds us that we live in a time where Jesus has ushered in the light and the day. John 1, 4. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus ushered in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, if you like, which will finally be completed when he returns. But the light is here. So we can be ready for Jesus' return by living as we belong to the light and the day, to hold on to the fact that we are in the light if we know Jesus. 1 Peter 2 verse says this, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We can also be ready, says this passage, by being awake and sober. Now, of course, this is a metaphorical awake. You know, Paul isn't saying we should stick matchsticks in our eyes and and never sleep or anything like that. Um, But what he's saying here is is another meaning of a sleep in this passage. So we've had that first one about those who sleep in Christ. Here, this is a different type of being asleep. In fact, it's the total opposite. It's about being not in touch with what is real. It's about not knowing Jesus. It's living as if this is all there is, trying to be satisfied with material things, living as if you're drunk not really knowing what's going on, what's real, what's not, sort of living within that hopelessness. That is the asleep that Paul is talking about here. So when he says we can be ready by being awake and sober, Paul is saying live in the knowledge of your salvation, watching and praying for Jesus' return. And of course he says that we can also put on that armour He says, wear faith and love as a breastplate. In other words, protect your heart with the faith and love of Jesus. Uh, Earlier this week, I was on retreat, and we were talking about that very subject, about protecting our hearts. It's so important to do. So much can come at us to discourage and distract us that we need to protect our hearts with the love of Jesus through faith. He also says, wear the hope of salvation as a helmet. In other words, protect your mind from hopelessness. Be reminded, if you like, of the salvation you have in Jesus. Remind your mind who you are in Jesus. Keep on keeping on with him. And then finally, be full of hope in how you live. I read this quote this week. How we behave is based on who we are. And if you're in Christ, you can live as one with hope, being hopeful. Life now with Jesus, without Jesus, is hopeless. It's like you're asleep, but with him, it's hopeful You can see the Greek word. Look, Andy, I'm doing some Greek. Um, Here's the Greek word elpis, um, which is hope, the Christian hope in Greek. And it's about joyful, confident expectation of eternal life through Jesus. It's not the sort of here's hoping uh, that we might hear uh, today, you know, which is sort of crossing your fingers and wishing something. It's a joyful, confident expectation. And we can live like that. And I believe one of the best ways we can do that 
is to do the other thing that Paul uh, says at the end of both of these chapters, chapter 4 and the other part of our reading in chapter 5, and that is simply to encourage each other. And here's the second Greek word. I'm doing two today. The second Greek word is parakaleo. Good word, parakaleo. And it's, uh, it's, it's translated in lots of different ways in the New Testament. It's about encouraging. It's about bringing comfort. It's about being, uh, walking alongside. It's another word for the counsellor um, in John 14. Paul says, encourage not yourselves, but one another. Allow the knowledge of Jesus' return to impact your view of death. Personally, I was seeing, uh, speaking to recently um, had just come to faith, and they said to me that they now don't fear death; they now have hope. They are awake; they are in the light, and they've experienced that partly because of the encouragement they've had from others. Let's encourage one another as we share the good news of Jesus. Let's cheer each other on and encourage one another. Oh, don't worry, Jesus is coming again. And as I said earlier, of course this should also impact how we respond to those who don't yet know Jesus. This reading reminds us that there is a time limit. And so let's be ready to share the, uh, with others the hope that we have. These words from 1 Peter 3. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. Then it goes on to say, but do this with gentleness and respect. That's really important, obviously. So let's not be uninformed. Let's not be surprised. Let's not grieve like the world. Let's hold on to the hope we have. Let's be ready. Let's be full of hope. If we'd had time, I was going to show you a video um, from a guy called Simon Thomas who used to uh, present Blue Peter and also the football, appropriate today. Um, But um, I will try and send that out later in the week because it is a wonderful testimony of how someone who experienced bereavement um, kept that sense of hope, even though it was clinging on with one finger, and also how he he was encouraged by others around him. So I'll send you that later. But let's pray as we finish. Can I invite the band back as well, please? Let's encourage you, actually. Can you stand with me if you are able? Because we will then be going on to sing a song of praise. So just as you stand, I wonder what God has been saying to you uh, this morning. How might you take what we have thought about today with you as you go from this place? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the hope that we find in Jesus, for the reminder that Jesus will return and all of what that means for each one of us. Help us to encourage and build one another up in this. And Lord, give us confidence to share this hope with those that we know. In Jesus' name.